As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. One sweet here, this is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, vlog number 36 and the 26th Sunday after Pentecost. We have, this is an unusual week because this week, usually the lectionary is compiled conceptually. And this is one of the few weeks that actually it's perceptually and uh, kind of aligned and uh, collated. And the, the image around which all of these texts um, kind of revolve is the image of the shepherd and the sheep. And this is very rare. So this is a very semiotic week, if you will, because all the texts relate to the, this, this theme of the shepherd's relationship with the sheep. Starting out in Ezekiel and the, uh, the 34th chapter, I will look after my sheep. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel and on the ravines. I will tend them in good pasture. I myself will tend my sheep and will have them lie down. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will shepherd the flock with justice. So a beautiful, beautiful uh, assertion and proclamation of what it means to be a sheep to a shepherd like Yahweh. And how we can trust and organize our lives and, and security and safety and, and shalom with, with the Lord as my shepherd. And then you have Psalm 100. And I, I just want to, I want to read this. That You all know this psalm. Some of you have actually memorized it. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. And we now translate it as shout to the Lord or shout for joy. But make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. See, with the shepherd like God, we can enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, be thankful to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. So the kind of gratitude and thanks that comes from the sheep when you have the Lord as my shepherd. The, the epistle reading from Ephesians uh, is, a, is Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. And this is the a proclamation of the hope that we have, the, the hope to which we have been called by Christ, and the, the actual basis and foundation of that hope is, now here it is, um, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his um, incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and exalted him at his right hand into the heavenly realm. The same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and me. I can hear Chris Tomlin now. We have resurrection power, can't you? That's the soundtrack I'm hearing in my head. But, but the, 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 when you are the sheep of his pasture and you live as a part of his flock, the same, the same resurrection power that raised Jesus can raise us from whatever difficulty we are in and, and facing. So an incredible passage of, that, again, leads to thanksgiving and gratitude. And then the gospel reading, uh, this, this passage where uh, we have the judgment of the nations and the judgment of all peoples. And the basis is of this judgment is that the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, bless them, my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me Food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, 
and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the, uh, then the judge will say to those at the other hand, depart from me. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Did, did, you, did you get this? I mean, there's a subtle shift here. It is not so much just the fact that, okay, if it's Jesus, you, you clothe and feed him. But he says you did not. So it's not just our, our sins of commission. It's our sins of omission. See, it's what we didn't do, not just what we did do. Okay, yeah, you, you fed me, but, but you, you didn't feed those that I was in and you missed. And so we have a, a huge shift here in how we are being held accountable and, and what does it mean um, that we are going to be judged one day, not just on what we did do, but on what we didn't do. And this is, this is huge. Um, in as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me and you're being judged accordingly. So what does it mean that Jesus is the shepherd? What does it mean that, that we, are, we are the sheep? And because he has done all this for us, we, the posture, and this is so appropriate for Thanksgiving, the posture of the sheep to the shepherd is one of, of gratitude. Because he gives us this resurrection power, let us give thanks. Because he takes care of the sheep, let, let, us, let us give thanks. And, and uh, there's, there's two, I think, appropriate responses um, to, to God by the shepherd, from the sheep to the shepherd. And one is a, is a heads down, and the other is a hearts up. And what I mean by this is that really we can only say two things to God. Um, two basic fundamental things. And one is, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for all the things that I have not done, that I should have done. Forgive me, not just for the sins of commission, but for my sins of omission, because I did see people that were hungry and I didn't feed them. And, and in as much as I didn't do it to them, I didn't do it to you. So for, forgive me, forgive me. Um, Paul, Paul put it like this, the, wood, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, I do. I mean, we, we want to do good, but we do bad, but sometimes we, we do bad when we're even trying to do, do good. So the, the, the heads down of forgive me, forgive me. But then the second thing we, we owe God, and we, we, we need to, to say to God, is, you ready? It's the hearts up. Thank you. Thank you. This is called the sursum corda. This is what begins every Eucharist. And, and it means uh, lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. That's called the sursum corda. We lift up our hearts. Why don't we lift up our hearts? And another way, putting it is just hearts up, hearts up, hearts up. How, why do we lift up our hearts? Out of gratitude. This is, begins the Eucharistic uh, moment. And so we, we our heads down of forgive me, but our hearts up of thank you for all that you have done, for all that you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I didn't do this, forgive me, but you did all this for me. Thank you, thank you. So the, the forgive me and the, and the thank you are basically the, the two chords that we strike with the, with, with the, with the music of our, our life. Um, you say, well, what about I love you? Isn't that one of the, shouldn't that one of be the fundamental chords that, that, that we strike as well? I love you. Well, wait a minute. 
We can only love, why? Because Christ first loved us. Because we're only able to love because God loved us first. So that first initiative is with God. And for that initiative, we say, thank you. So really, I love you is a subsidiary of thank you. Thank you for loving me so that I can love in return. Um, and, and, and loving God is really, in some ways, I'm suggesting a derivative of thanking God. Uh, he first loved us. So the thank you kind of encompasses and embraces the, uh, the first love that God showed to us in the first place, without which we, we couldn't love. So thank you. Thank you for giving me all of the shepherd's gifts to the sheep. Thank you for giving me, as Paul put it here in, in Ephesians, this resurrection power. But thank you for giving me the ability to love. Thank you. Thank you. But most of all, thank you for giving me all that I need to be who you me, made me to be and who you are calling me to be. And, and I, I want you to listen to me very carefully here because this is very subtle and it's, it's very nuanced. And so you've got to catch the, the, the subtleties here. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift that's already been given to us. Now, we have to receive that gift, but you don't have to reach for it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to strive for it. You don't have to discipline yourself to get it. You don't have to manufacture it. You don't have to conjure it or cajole it. You already have. Um, all that you need for this gift of faith. It, 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 there's no right words that, that you, uh, you, know, you, you chant that can make it come your way. It's already yours. You already have the life of God. Just let it in. I mean, that's the point of opening up our hands to receive the gift that we already have. It, you Just let it in. Um, let it take you over. You already have in you. You were created in the image of God. You have already in you the germ of the gospel. You have the sap of the spirit. You have the seed of Christ already in you. You don't need to, to pray for that to come to you. It's already there in you. You just need to, for that germ to germinate. And there you need water. You need, you need air. You need sun. You need light. But... It's already there. Some of us say, oh, we got to strive. It's a prize that we achieve. No, it's not a prize. Faith is not a prize. Sanctification is not a prize. It's, it's just letting you open up to be who God already made you to be. Water it. God made you for life in Christ. Let Christ in. You don't train for it as you would train for some prize. Open yourself up to your being. You carry the end. In your heart right now you carry already who you are within you you just have to let it let it out the shepherd's relationship with the sheep is not something toward which we are striving or moving union and communion with our Creator is a gift God made you for union and communion with God it's the basic condition of our being it's our biggest gift we just have to receive the gift and just let it come in let it flow and, and I, I have here um, something that um, is in the dark it's pretty uh, flat worthless um, kind of just kind of interesting but nothing special and this is a this is a uh, one one kind of a crystal, um, and it's just got all these angles, all these um, edges. Some are flat, some are circular, but it's a poor example of a crystal. But it's the only one I got, so that's the one we're going to use. But if you if you keep it in the dark and you don't bring it out into the light, it's it's not going to glisten. It's not going to glow. There's nothing going to be special to it. But if the crystal is brought into the light 
and allows itself to be illuminated and penetrated and invaded by the light, suddenly it comes alive and you see what it, what it really is. And what it really is, is this incredible, beautiful, dazzling, dynamic, um, radiant source of light. Now, it's a reflected light, but it's, it's already who it is. It's already there. It's just allowing itself to come into the light. In Christ's light, we come to life. Take yourself out of the shade, out of the shadows, out of the darkness. Bring it into the light of Christ. Be the sheep of his pasture. And in that light, we, we come to That's all it takes. That's all it takes. The light of the world, so that we can become little lights of the world, just bring it into the light. And that's all. Let the light of Christ take you over. Come out of those caves. Come out of that darkness. Jesus didn't say, sometimes I wish he did. Um, you are the thunder and lightning of the world. <laughs> I, 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 sometimes I want a thunder and lightning. But he did say you are the salt and light. We're not the thunder and lightning. We're, we're the, the salt and the light. And the salt is an active substance which does its work silently. It does its work without fanfare. It does its work without violence. And the light... The light is a reflective light. It's a light that suddenly, and you see all sorts of mysteries inside when you allow yourself to reflect the light of Christ. And its reflective power is kind and is gentle and it's loving and it's inviting. We are not called to be thunder and lightning. We're called to be salt and light. I had, I had an Appalachian grandfather, George Lemuel Boggs. He was a sawyer. Uh, went up into the hills. He had three brothers that also had competing sawyer firms. And they, they brought the saws with them as the uh, lumberjacks would tear, take down the trees. They'd saw them up. But uh, he, he insisted that there were certain kinds of marble um, in that, that he said, after being in the light for a long period of time, could so fix the light within itself that they became almost phosphorescent. In other words, even after you took, if, if, the, if the marble, is the crystal, has been out of, in the light for a long period of time, it was reflecting and all of its beauty and dazzling, and then it, it came out of the light you could still, for a certain period of time, see the light radiate from within because it had been in that light and it had seeped into even the marble. I don't think the soul is as hard as marble, so I think even our spirits can take in the light of Christ. And, and then when we are in those dark moments and go through those valleys of the shadow, even then we can also radiate the light of Christ, the image of God that's in, in each one of us. We have radiatory power, um, and you might even call it resurrection power, the ability to radiate the light of Christ that shines within us and through us, um, or to be, as the early Christians called us, little Christ. So I, I, don't, I don't know for sure that um, my grandfather was right. I do know for sure that minerals with phosphorescence can glow for a brief time after the light source is turned off. And it's called thermoluminescence. It's the ability of a mineral to shine and emit a small amount of light after it's been heated and even when it's taken out of the light. Thermoluminescence. And to keep radiating the light, even after the light is turned off, we need thermolescent disciples. Thermolescent disciples who live with gratitude and grace. Because, why? The Lord is my shepherd. Why? And what does that mean? 
I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. I have a friend, Terry Herkus, who, who retranslate that. He restoreth my soul as he restores my soul. And in all of our readings this week, we're given the story of the shepherd and the sheep. And the response of the sheep to the shepherd Heads down, forgive me. Hearts up, thank you. The spirit of thanksgiving, the pillar of life, gratitude and grace. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember, it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon.